welcome everybody. So nice to be here. So briefly before I introduce, introduce our speaker, I'm gonna share that in 2018, when I, after I had my NDE, which I had no idea what I really had, at some point I realized that my life was never gonna be the same again. And something guided me to type into Google because many people know I do marketing and SEO. So I, I use Google a lot. So I just literally, I don't, I didn't even know why, but I typed in the after effects of near death experiences. And I pulled up this article at the time. I didn't know who had written it. I didn't understand. I couldn't even remember this IONS organization, their, their acronym. And I just, every effect listed, I had every symptom. And it was like freedom. Uh, so I sent it to my sister and I sent it to a few people. And within a month or two, we started our first little NDE group to like, you know, talk to other people. So it's a huge honor for me to be able to introduce our speaker who was the, right, the author of that article. And uh, I, I am so humbled and honored to have PMH Atwater has basically been a savior in so many ways. She's written over 18 books on near-death experiences. For 44 years, she's a chaplain, a prayer coach, and just an overall amazing person. So I'm so honored that you are here speaking with us. Oh, and she's working on her 19th book, which she will be telling us some about. So thank you so much, PMH. And I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very, very much. All these faces. I mean, it's overwhelming. <laughs> so let's get on with it. The first thing I want to say is I stand with Ukraine. Absolutely. I hope all of the rest of you do as well. I want to tell you a little story uh about 12 years ago when i was in moscow russia i was there to deliver talks and workshops on the near-death experience and come to find out when i was there that, that the people there were not were not interested in anything i had to say nothing they wanted to know about other things besides what i represented so the book publisher spun around and said, well, I will instead tour you around Mos Moscow. Would you like that? And I was there with my son-in-law, Greg, and we said, yeah, <laughs> we'll take the trade off, sure. So we got to have a most incredible tour of Moscow. And I, and I won't talk about all the things that we saw because that would take forever. Uh, but I, I do want to talk about one particular incident. Um, and that is we were on a high bluff overlooking the river and in the distance the city of moscow that bluff that we were standing on was at the foot of one of stalin's architectural masterpieces and so i was as i was standing at the foot of stalin's masterpiece looking out at this incredible scene before me, I was thinking to myself, uh, how wonderful it is that Stalin is gone. You know, I'm a World War II baby. I grew up with Hitler. I grew up with Hitler and the Gestapo. And I very vivid, vivid 
you know, visions of Pearl Harbor. So that was a big thing for me. So for me to be standing there looking over this great expanse and being able to say, as, as I was standing there looking at this expanse and saying to myself, thank heaven Stalin is gone. You know, and saying it with all my heart, there's this voice from the right-hand part of me standing to the right or, or being to the right of me. It was a very clear voice. And it said, and I quote, Stalin is back. His name is Putin. I hope all of you remember that and pass it on and tell everyone. Stalin is back. His name is Putin. It took me all these years to figure out what that meant. I now know. I'm a war baby. I know what this is like. And I know what it's like for the people in Ukraine. Okay, let's, let's be here and now in America and all over the world. Those, those people who are joining us and want to be part of this program. This program is about the after effects of, of near-death experiences. I wanna lay down some facts and figures and you know some information and we can go from there. Because I wanna be very, very clear on what that pattern is. And what it seems to signify. When we're talking about the near death experience, please know there are several, several models of what a near death experience is. We all know about near hyphen death experience. But did you know there can be fear deaths? A fear death is a kind of incident that, the, that can and does occur when there's no physical trauma, but a person is scared out of their wits to the point that um, that they undergo the pattern of a near-death experience. So that's a fear death. We also have empathic or shared near-death experiences. Per person never had a near-death experience, but uh, being at the bedside of a dying indivi individual can go with them. And, and, and can go to a point where they um, can undergo what their loved one or the other individual is feeling and going through to the point that they too are changed, even though there is a line or a marker or a feeling or whatever, that keeps them from going all the way. In other words, they don't actually physically die, but they feel as if they had, and they come back exhibiting the after effects of a near-death experience. We also have near-death experiences that can happen to multiple personalities. And the central personality there always is a central one, can go through such an experience to the point that their multiples begin to fade and the central personality then begins to heal. I've had several of those in my research and I've talked about them in my various books. So, so that gives us an idea then of that we can look at the near-death experience 
through various kinds of angles. I want to add another one. It doesn't seem to have any particular name, but it happens to those people who never went through any kind of crisis, but still had a near-death experience. Let, let me give you an example. I'll give you an example of two of them that were in my research. One, uh, a woman, it was a Sunday morning. She went out on her porch to pick up uh, these big, huge newspapers that we have on Sunday mornings, you know, that are filled with cartoons and all kinds of extras. And as she began to straighten from picking up this huge news, newspaper and look into the rising sun, she literally went into the sun and came back totally changed, exhibiting all of the after effects of a near-death experience throughout her life afterward. Second one, this is an, uh, a Canadian African, and he was in his um, apartment. He got up from his sofa, walked across his living room in his apartment, went over to the big windows. I, I, I don't remember whether he was opening them or closing, uh, closing them, but did what he wanted with the windows, was walking back to his sofa when he literally walked into a full near-death experience. Of course, that completely and totally changed him. And in his near-death experience, he was told to go to all of those colleges that train ministers to teach them and show them that they were teaching or learning the wrong Bible and to show them the right Bible. That was his mission after that. And that's what he did until the day he finally died. And on his deathbed, I was able finally to locate him, call him on the phone and, and, and was there when he took his last uh, breaths, feeling that he has failed. And I could tell him, no, he didn't fail. He, uh, he had accomplished more good than he could ever know. And soon after that, he took his last breath so I could be there with him when he died. Let me tell you just quickly a little bit about myself and why I'm a researcher, and then we'll go on with the research. In 1977, I died. Before that, I was raped. I became pregnant, miscarried, and it was because of the miscarriage and the many, many problems with it that caused my death. So death number one was January 2, death number three, or uh, death number one, death number two was January 4, death number three was March 29 of 1977. So I had three in three months. When it was over, I had to relearn how to crawl, how to stand, how to walk, how to talk properly, how to see and use all kinds of things left and right see properly, hear properly, and rebuild all my belief systems. And later that fall, in October, September and October, I had three major relapses, one of which was total adrenal failure. It was because of friends and my doctor at the time, who was a naturopath, feeling that change of scenery would do me more good than more medicine. They trucked me up to uh, Seattle, Washington, where I could see the Mind Miraculous Symposium at the Seattle Center. There, first speaker, Dr. William Tiller, physicist from Stafford. His talk was the eternal now. Couldn't tell you a thing the man said, but at the end of his talk, he flashed onto this giant screen, you know, many stories tall, huge thing. His version, of what he feels is the eternal now. He believes that all things happen at the same time in the same place. There is an eternal now and that it can be defined using physics. So he, he flashed onto this great screen. His version, his picture 
of the eternal now, what it looked like. And it was exactly what I saw in my third near-death experience. And I uh, <laughs> jumped up and ran for the room and collapsed under a light fixture in the, in the foyer. And, and, you know, and I'm down on the floor, you know, rocking back and forth saying, I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. He saw it too. I'm not crazy. After that, that I began to heal. And a year later, when I began my research in 1978, only because the only reason I ever did research is because in my third near-death experience, I was told by what I call the voice like none other. The voice that spoke to me was not a guide, a guardian, an arch you know, our archangel or any of this stuff. I called it the voice like none other because I couldn't compare it, compare it to anything. It was like the universe speaking. And that voice said, test revelation. You are to do the research, one book for each death. It did not name book number one. I think it, that book was coming back to life, my first major book. Don't know, but it did name books two and three. Book number two is future memory. If you haven't read it, do. It's not a book, by the way. It's a labyrinth. Every sentence, every paragraph, every page is part of the math I use to create the labyrinth. It is a real labyrinth. The only purpose of that book is to raise your consciousness, consciousness, consciousness up to the next highest level possible for you at that time. So, so it's a brain changer. It's a literal brain changer. The third book was a manual for developing humans. Did you realize that, you know, several thousand years ago, maybe 1500 years ago, the sound of hue was considered the sound of God. So if you said hue man, you said God man, God man, God woman. So human was literally God man, God woman, literally. So to be a human enabled you to be what you come back from a near-death experience as a co-creator with the creator. So if you get the book, A Manual for Developing Humans, it begins with the first, the first two sections are what I recommend for all near-death experiencers. And then it goes on from there. And all the thought form drawings I did myself. Two main things every near-death experiencer and those like them must learn is how to talk and how to think. You've been somewhere else. You are now changed. You need to relearn what thinking and speaking are and how to do it in a way that honors your changes in who you are as well as the world and all its peoples around you. So that's where you begin. Begin to relearn how to think and how to speak. I did. And it made massive difference. What I took to relearn how to think, I don't know if you've ever heard, I, you it used to be science of mind churches. And then, then they changed it to a, a different kind of name. Now they call it Centers of Spiritual Living, based on the book by Ernest Holmes. And if you can take those kinds of classes, and this is not a church per se, but you know, a class in spiritual living. If you take their SOM1, which is Science of Mind 1, it teaches you how to think. I took that class. Wow, the difference it made. Whoa, the difference it made. If you can possibly take that class, take it. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Wonderful class. Really get you. So that gives you, I think, some kind of bearing. 1977 was my year to be a human being again. Where I could be back in control of my own body. I'm back in control of my own life, at least sort of. And the next year, um, 1978, is when I left Idaho and went where I was guided to go, which was east, which was the Washington, D.C. area. And to me, any place east 
of Denver <laughs> was in Greece. You know, it wasn't even in the United States. I was a typical Westerner. Getting used to the East was like, for me, getting used to a, another country altogether. Totally different from where I was from. And I began my research of the near-death experience. <laughs> well, you know, I'm a cop's kid. I was raised in a police station. I use police investigative techniques as my protocol. And where do I begin my research? Giving a talk? <laughs> At a police station. <laughs> really, really in Arlington. And they had an extra large room and people could come in there and, you know, give talks or whatever. And, that's where I gave my first talk <laughs> Ah, at a police station. Thank you, God. That was so great. And that, that's when I began my research. My guide, what enabled me to know what the phenomenon is and how it affected people was Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. I'd never heard of Raymond Moody, never read his book. But it was, just, it was in 1978, I was at O'Hare Airport going to visit an aunt and an uncle who lived in the Chicago area. And who do I meet at the airport but Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. She was late for a plane ride to Europe. And so it was just the two of us settled down on a little bench talking like a couple of schoolgirls. And I told her what happened to me in my three near-death experiences. She's the one who labeled me. You are a near-death survivor. She did not say experiencer, survivor. And I really felt like a survivor. And she then told me about the phenomenon and what, what it was. So I started my research all by myself. It was years later that Kenneth Ring found out about me. Call me on the phone. Kenneth Ring, if you don't know about Kenneth Ring, he is the, Kenneth Ring, PhD, he is the man who, who validated Raymond Moody's research and proved that it was scientific and valid. So Raymond Moody owes his existence, as it were, to Kenneth Ring. And it was, it was Kenneth Ring who discovered me and, and wanted to come down and visit. Um, I was married by then. And uh, Terry and I were living in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and Ken Ring came down and wanted to stay overnight, said, that's fine. We talked all night long, talked all about my research and my findings and what I had done. And he was aware of some of it because of other people he'd talked to. And he said to me, you're ahead of anybody else. You know more than anybody else knows. You have to come up to Stores, Connecticut, meet your colleagues and join the International Association of Near-Death Studies. I had colleagues? <laughs> you gotta be joking. I have colleagues. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I went up there and the rest is history. You know, I joined, you know, the internet started when IANS was maybe a couple of months old. <laughs> and that's when I started and became acquainted with what other people were doing. And they were amazed at me and I was befuddled by them. So... <laughs> A wonderful party. So what I want to do next is give you a little percentage because that will give you an idea of the pattern of after effects. And then I just want to go through them. I, I want to just launch right into them. What they are and maybe say a little bit more and then all of us can get involved. That is to say, we can ask questions, you can make comments, you can do whatever you want to do. But I want to talk about the real after effects. Because some people talk a little bit about some of them, or a little bit about some others, leave out this, leave out that, emphasize this, and never mention the others. 
So let's get into that. The near-death experience in my research, 21%, and we're talking here originally 3,000 people, but I will include my latest findings because the percentages have not varied hardly at all in this. So we could basically say 5,000 adults and children. 21% claim no after, no after effects or certainly, certainly none that made much of a difference in their life. Yeah, it was like a dream. 60% claimed significant changes afterward. 19% said that the changes were of such an effect that it was as if they had become another person. So we're talking radical, radical. If we look at those figures, we're re really looking at, and I wanna be clear here, 79% of the people I have interviewed or worked with or know about, were unable to return to life as always. Folks, that's whopping. And I think most of you here know all about that. You could pro probably tell me as well as I can tell you. There's no way you can return to life as always. You may think you can, but it really kind of doesn't work. So what I want to do right now when we're talking about the pattern, I want to give you the full thing. I want to overwhelm you. And I'm going to take my glasses off. Yep. <laughs> I look kind of funny, don't I? Because I, want, I don't want to miss, miss anything here. I'm going to read it because I want to be clear. Metabolic changes. One's body seems to assimilate substances quicker than before, necessitating smaller doses of whatever might be needed in the way of supplementation or medication. An increase in allergies, also with pharmaceutical prescriptions, successf successfully taken in the past that can no longer be tolerated. A greater sensitivity to household chemicals, fabric and wood coatings, food preservatives, sprays, and perfumes. Breathing anomalies can, see, can cease breathing suddenly for no apparent reason, then resume later on without any apparent effect on a consciousness or performance. This is after, you know, uh, once you've come back. The, long, the longest stoppage of breath I am aware of was for nine, almost 10 minutes. So I'm talking about people who are no longer breathing, but are feeling just fine and go on with their life. And, uh, and then it occurs to them, well, you know, maybe I ought to restart my lungs so I can be breathing again. I've talked about a lot of these kind of people and I was one of them. Substantially lower blood pressure. Pulse rate can also decrease. A reduction in meat consumption. Some become vegetarians. By the way, adults tend to, to uh, fit this more than child experiencers. Um, what I found with children is the reverse. They tend more toward meat. Adults tend to go away from meat. A preference for openness, open doors, open windows, few, if any, shades, no locks, even cl closet doors are, are left open. They sure are in my house, drives my husband nuts. An ability to merge with whatever is focused on to exist in more than one dimension simultaneous to this one. 
so you can you know merge with other dimensions and by the way i can i can see i can say that's perfectly normal a lot of us do it in fact most of us do so don't don't feel like you're any kind of a freak if you're existing in other dimensions simultaneously as you are in this one i consider that normal the capacity to attract animals and birds even in the wild and perhaps hear them speak true also with plants youngsters may seek out experiencers as if attracted to their energy i've seen this happen a lot with near-death experiencers maybe they're in a bus depot or sitting in down for whatever reason and they'll attract little kids you know little kids will come right to them want to be around them it, it, it's you know it's interesting <laughs> cognitive ability or oh, thirst for knowledge latent talents can serve can surface laugh more it's completely normal as far as i'm concerned if a near-death experiencer suddenly wants to read the dictionary and go through different words in the dictionary it's like wow i didn't know that word existed you become very curious about all kinds of things that's why i publish <laughs> if you haven't caught on to this before this is why i pu publish a newsletter free monthly newsletter you get on my website you know www.pmhatwater.com go over to newsletter and and subscribe there's an archive there and you can go back but i'm just curious so the name of my newsletter is for the curious <laughs> of course of course cognitive abilities sometimes switch the thinking process continues to alter and change reversal of body clocks you know this is very common night people can become day people and vice versa heightened sensations of taste touch texture smell sense some become more orgasmic others turn off sex altogether develop healing gifts even if suddenly able to heal instruction is still helpful hear this you everybody hear this uh, to be better able to handle the broader dynamics involved so i don't care how smart you are how good you are you can still use some lessons continue to see and hear beings met in death usually only once in a while but can lead to mediumistic abilities possible to stop or control with existence or proper training if you want to synchronicity by the way is common commonplace you know every day things just come together electrical sensitivity oh this is a big one almost all of us have it some more than others it can be comical it can be frightening it's got you may need to take measures to limit exposure to digital electrical worlds and to protect oneself from power generators exposure during lightning storms tornadoes earthquakes avoid living near a power station or a cell phone tower can on occasion start electrical stardom electrical appliances car batteries and a time and appliances simply by touching them best to wear watches that utilize solar batteries so if you've got a, the other kind of battery get rid of that thing use solar batteries time can shift lengthen shorten or twist directions you can on occasion move in and out of time seeming to appear and disappear as we come and go Think this is a lot to, to handle? Ah, rethink. The majority begins to awaken uh, at around through to three to four a.m. each night. Take a look at what else happens during that time. Melatonin levels peak in the pineal gland, affects conversion of light waves into energy, deeper function of pineal 
peaks in the production of DMT, the spirit molecule. Schumann waves peak, that is the basic frequency of our planet called the Earth's heartbeat. Most crops circles around the world form during this time, three to four each night. Medically is called the hour of the wolf because this time frame is associated with congest congestive heart failure and other serious illnesses. Creatively referred to as the hour of the muse because of it being a great time for inspiration, uplifting ideas, innovative art and understanding. And of course, 4 a.m. is the first prayer in the morning for Muslims. The time frame of 3 to 4 a.m. connects directly with light receptors in the brain and earth energy shifts. So you, you find yourself then folding and flowing right into the natural energies of yourself, your body, and the world around you. Note, near-death experiences return one to a more natural way of living, more in line with regular shifts of, of our planet. And which I've just said, great, no, not necessarily. This kind of thing seems to terrify or confuse many uh, experiencers. I am IAN's website and my own carry a section on NDE after effects begin there. You know, you can you can consider that first aid for experiencers. On on my on my website, you know, the home page uh, is a section called NDE after effects. Go into that. That's first aid for experiencers. Special health precautions for children, child experiencers, blood pressure. Although more adults than children ex exhibit a substantial drop in blood pressure after their experience, all should be aware that current medical opinion considers long time, low blood pressure, a major component of chronic fatigue. Experiencers who continue to be hale and hearty plus energetic should let their doctors know that low blood pressure is normal for NDEers. Light sensitivity. All well-meaning adults shove kids outside. Fresh air is healthy. But if the child is a near-death experiencer and the school teacher or a coach or parent for forces him or her to practice or play in bright sunshine for long periods of time day after day the result can be troublesome because of their sensitivity to light they can be subject to allergic reactions to bright sunshine or unusual states of fatigue perhaps weakening the body's immune system sound sensitivity this is big for kids. Peer pressure is hard for youngsters and teens. Types of music listened to and decimal level um, comprise the mark of allegiance to whatever is in. At dances, proms, parties, gatherings, even school-wide assemblies, sounds are blasted out or tuned way up or far out. This can be very painful, even injurious to a near-death experiencer, a child who is a near-death experiencer. Uh, here's, here's a good one for kids. Decreased tolerance of pharmaceuticals. This is good for all of us, especially kids. When a child is ill, he or she is rushed to a doctor, the emergency room, or a nearby hospital where a shot is administered or pills prescribed. This, this is standard. But if the little one is a near-death survivor, 
and suddenly more sensitive, possibly even allergic to this type of pharmaceutical normally administered to a child of his or her weight and age. Treatment can be more dangerous than the illness. Get that, most doctors treat kids according to their weight and age. If that kid is a near-death experiencer, the problem at hand can be made worse by the doctor's thought that they can treat that child as they could any other child. Wrong! Okay, anything else here? One other thing that will surprise you that I do want to read about. And I do apologize for reading, but hey, that's the only way I can get this out there and get it recorded. And then we can go from there. Folks, there is a before. Ta-da! Yeah, this is going to surprise everybody, but there is a before. I found it again and again and again. I never found anybody that avoided it. There is a before pattern. When a decision needed to be made and or times of deep dissatisfaction, disappointment, frustration, when feeling hurried all the time or excessively strained or running a tight ship. Um, I could list all of these, but, but basically it means times of high stress. If you had a time of a high stress where you went on and on and on with stress, that can be a before to a near-death experience. Now I'm gonna put my glasses on <laughs> so I can look more normal. I don't have to tell you, any of you, that having a near-death experience changes you, some more than others. But I wanna make this clear about integration, the time it takes to integrate a near-death experience. For adults, it takes seven to 10 years. The first three years of that period is the time when things tend to be so big that they can sometimes feel hard to handle. Seven to 10 years for adults. A child experiencer, especially those birth to the age of five, it takes 20 to 40 years. Do you hear that? 20 to 40. A child does not integrate, they compensate. Takes a long time for them to wake up and realize, whoops, this is something else. And I better take a look at that. Certainly counselors and psychiatrists can help, but if they don't know anything about a near-death experience, they probably won't be that helpful. I, I, I hope all of you by now have read The Forever Angels. No study uh, like this has, has ever been done, ever. With child near-death experiencers, we can see what happens, especially with the after effects, from birth until about maybe the age of 20 to 30, with people who had a near-death experience, but are now 60, 70, or 80, and can validate that they had an experience, 
between birth and the age of five or certainly birth of the uh, birth to the age of eight. For those people who are now older looking back, when we take a look at their story and compare it with the younger people, same story, young and old, young looking forward, old looking back. We get the full circle of after effects. That's why everybody needs to read that book, The Forever Angels. And it shows us for sure, there's 397 people participated. This is a major study. It shows us for sure that most people remember their birth. In my study, one third could remember being in the womb. Two could remember conception. One, when she was old enough, drew a picture about it, showed it to her parents, and they were so embarrassed they couldn't talk about it. She was that accurate. But she wasn't even in the womb yet. She was circling around, waiting to come in. The near-death experience, if you want to be honest, propels us to look at life itself. What do we mean by life? What do we mean by breathing? What do we mean by living in a body? And how do we handle that body once we're there? It gives us a whole new different way of considering not only life, but of being who we are. And because of that, some of us can handle it and some of us can't, because it seems to run counter to what we learned in school and what we learn living life. How do we handle all of this stuff? Living in life and living in a way that honors what we know to be true. You know, there's all kinds of lessons and people and who can help us and, you know, but, you know, there's that big but, 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 but. What do we do next? Well, what do we do next? We educate ourselves. And that's what we're doing tonight. And hey, dear, dear friend, Sean, let's let let's just start talking everybody let's start sharing let's start questioning let's start opening our eyes and realize that there's more to who we think we are than exists okay let's go from there sean where do we go from here wow so amazing and so validating for us and the ears that you have helped beyond measure. So why don't uh, everybody who would like to ask a question, let's start with the questions first. You can put, type your, uh, so we're gonna type the uh, chats in the question, or I mean the questions in the chat, and then, and then I'm gonna read them or you can uh, send them to me directly. And we will go uh, from there and then PMH will answer them. So <laughs> I have, I have a, a few that are already sent to us. Now, um, hey, so, take off. let's do it. So we'll start off with you and your experience. Uh, so you had to, which is something that happened to me. I had to relearn everything, go to rehab hospital. Oh, Can you talk more about that and what? That was like that, that was a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. And and a lot of fear. You know, um, you come back from a near death experience and you and yeah, um it's not necessarily helpful. <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, where you've been is so great, and you come back to this body and, and you just say, you know, what do you do now? I mean, how do you go to work? How do you be a mother? How do you be a father? 
I mean, um, how do you eat? I had to relearn how to eat. Yes, I did. Um, before I died, <laughs> I was really accomplished in the field of astrology, numerology, psychic, psychic stuff. Um, I was a bank analyst <laughs> and doing the other stuff too. Um, and I started Idaho's first nonprofit metaphysical corporation by the name of Inner Forum. Uh, we were doing experiments with, with all kinds of different people and clubs and groups. Easily over 3,000 people benefited from our programs. I mean, it was heavily into this when I was just a little kid. <laughs> I did my first double blind research project at the age of five. <laughs> I was always doing this kind of stuff. And one of the first things, one of the many things I had to contend with when I was a first grader, oh, Ah, oh, what I had to contend with. Pearl Harbor, World War II. One of the things the government did for people then was any time you lost a loved one in the war effort, you were given a large gold decal, which you put on your living room window. So anybody who was walking by could see you had lost a loved one in the war effort. You know, this was a, a big, big deal. And so walking to school every morning was for me a, a, a path of death. Little Twin Falls, Idaho. You, you know, we lost a lot of people in World War II. We lost a lot of people in Pearl Harbor. And I never will forget this one house I'm walking by, had six new gold stars overnight. I stood there and I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. I do not remember one single morning when I didn't have to stop my sobs and shudders just to walk in the door of my first grade, grade uh, class. And on top of that, I was born was synesthesia and dyslexia. Now today, most people know about dyslexia, but they don't know necessarily about synesthesia. And that is an elaboration of the limbic system. So I could smell color, see music and hear numbers. This was honest. And the teacher thought I was lying. The, the principal of the school tried to kick me out. I spent most of the first grade sitting on a tall stool in front of the class, having to wear a ta tall conical hat that said dunce on it as an example of a bad child who told lines. And all I was doing is telling the truth. And at the end of the first grade, I was so angry. I was just so angry. I decided all adults are stupid and I'm never going to be one when I grow up. <laughs> so there's some of my stories. <laughs> That's uh, okay, so my book. <laughs> can you think of one? It's going to be maybe hard. But what would you be the, is the greatest gift that you learned from your NDE? And... Uh, and if there's one, th so one thing that you learned and that you put into practice daily that you learned from your end. What's the one? Is there one that you can think of? I know there's tons of stuff, but if one thing that stands out the most. Be at peace with my soul. Mm, perfect. Beautiful. Okay. What's one thing about daily life on earth that people who haven't had a near-death experience um, should know? I didn't get that. So, so what is one thing, so uh, what is one thing about daily life that people who haven't had an NDE should know? If you can. 
alive and wonderful and refreshing and exciting it is. Woo! You know, daily life is just gangbusters. For me, just walking down the stairs is like a double wow. You know, cooking. I always ask the food what it wants to do, and we both have fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Perfect gift. Yes, it is such a gift. Do you believe in reincarnations? Did you experience reincarnation? Reincarnation before? is not something to believe in. Okay. Reincarnation is an example of what can occur when our minds shift. So I do not necessarily subscribe to reincarnational lusts. Rather, I simply look at it as another way of being and living and dying and breathing and going on with life. Beautiful. That's a great answer. Look, when I was a little kid, my birth mother, I could not accept my birth mother's um, hmm, way of handling me, her discipline, because I knew I was her mother in a pre previous existence, and she was my child, and how dare she tell me what to do. So <laughs> I didn't behave very well. <laughs> You don't believe it's linear. You believe it's all happening at once, right? Did you mention something like that? I do not think we know what time is. Yeah. I do not go along with the idea that it's before or after or ahead of us or whatever. Because time seems to flow. And that flowing has an ebb and movement that we cannot define really. And I don't think any of us really understand it. So I don't necessarily look at something as before. I simply look at it as part of me. Would you like to share what you experienced about God or Jesus? Oh, God is my every breath. You know, most near-death experiencers return head over heels in love with God. And if you want to take that G-O-D and toss it and use another term, that's fine. Doesn't matter. You can call it Allah. You can call it deity. You can call it whatever you want to call it. But this idea of a greater beingness that ebbs and flows. And in that ebbing and flowing consciousness, simply moves in tandem. And that greater ebb and flow, that greater music, that greater tone, that greater isness is so magical and so wondrous. and so fulfilling that I simply cannot imagine a day without prayer, a morning without prayer. I can't imagine life without some kind of church or celebration. Because that isness, that greatness is so wondrous. 
that I want always, always to be part of that. Wow, amazing. So our friend So says that she has heard that you've given talks at the UN before. Woo! If, if That's going can... back a ways. Yes, I was at the UN several times. So if you could give a talk to them now, after a half a century, almost, what would you say? I, I doubt if they'd let me in the door. <laughs> really? Honestly, I don't think they'd let me in the door now. I would certainly want to speak about how human beings can and do change, whether they want to or not, and where that change can lead. Some MD ears report the importance of meditation to reconnect to that space. You betcha. What, what are your thoughts <laughs> you on this? And do you <laughs> I can't imagine anybody who doesn't meditate. <laughs> <laughs> that was an easy one. Well, sometimes meditation can interfere with your meditation. Sometimes you can get so strict with that. Someone going around with some kind of stick hitting you because you're not doing it the right way. Nonsense. Absolutely nonsense. That kind of, inter of meditation can interfere with your meditation. Did they do that at the Zen place that you, you guys met at with the bamboo stick? Uh, we, we met at a unity church in Roanoke, Virginia. It was a Friday night and there was a speaker in the fellowship hall about, about Zen meditation. That speaker uh, practiced Zen meditation and was there to teach us all how to do it. Well, I already knew. Um, so, and, and I liked it and I, and I wanted, I, I mean, the idea of Zen in Roanoke, Virginia, are you kidding? I mean, who? So I, you know, I, I just wanted to be there to see if it was real. And Terry, similar, I guess, except for him, it was more of a learning experience. For, for me, it was a joyous experience. He was sitting in the back row, in, in the back row. I was sitting on the floor in the lotus position in the front row. We'd have never met had it not been for this lovely uh, older couple that I was um, renting a room from. And they had previously decided that the two of us would make a good couple never told me that, never told him that. But they saw us together in the same room and they decided that the two of us somehow, some way were going to meet. So he, um, Don stationed himself at one door and Nettie stationed herself at another door. And they made certain that they grabbed us, pulled us together and made certain we would meet. And we did. You know, I didn't know they had a plan. They were matchmakers. I didn't know they had a plan. They had a plan. They didn't tell us about it until about a year later. And that, and that plan was to get us together that Saturday, the next day, for a spaghetti dinner at their place. And um, for us to get together, you know, more and better and you know, whatever. But that happened to be a day when I was outside taking a long walk and, you know, the idea of the coming of rain and it was cloudy, it was about ready to rain. And I was way out where, where the road ends. <laughs> I'm still walking. <laughs> and, um, and I saw Terry as, as I, um, made a bend and um, Terry, I guess, was doing a reconnoiter because it wasn't too good with directions and he wanted to make sure he knew how to get to the rep's place. 
is Don and Nettie Rep, who I stayed with. And so he was there just to see if he could find the place because it wasn't that good with directions. And, and so I signed drive up, recognized him from the night before, went over to him and I said, would you like to walk with me? And he thought about it for a minute. He says, okay, I'll do that. So he got out, rolled up, rolled up the windows on his car. We joined hands. We began walking. And we got to the end of the walk. It began to rain. And it had been predicted back in, in Boise, Idaho that I would meet the man of my dreams in a rainstorm. Well, it began to rain. There was a rainstorm. <laughs> problem for me. I'm, I'm from Idaho. You just look for a good ditch with a rain, rain cover <laughs> and you'll be just fine. So I found a good ditch and, and we burrowed right in there uh, and good weed cover. We're as dry as could be. And we're visiting and of course, Don and Nettie were worried. They come in their car. And, you know, I didn't realize, none of, neither of us realized that Terry's legs were visible from, from the road. <laughs> and, and, and you you got to know Reddy, Nettie. Yeah. She was a bit plump, but she had a voice like thunder. I mean, she didn't have a woman's voice. She had a voice like God. And she comes out of her, her car and she says, Terry Abbotter, what are you doing in the weeds? <laughs> yeah, I cried. What are you doing in there with him? <laughs> it was so funny. Uh, and, and so, you know, <laughs> they offered to drive us back. We said, no, we'll walk it. But then it was, the rain had stopped. Um. We walked back, had a nice time. Six weeks later, we married. That was 42 years ago. I can honestly say I married my angel. We are directly opposite in just about everything except our love of God. He's black, I'm white. I'm right-handed, he's left-handed. I can find anything. He, he can't hardly find anything. I can always. I'm practical, he's um, conservative. He's a conservative fellow. He loves grand opera. You know, I don't. Um, you name it, we're just the opposite. But life is just so fun. I can't imagine living with someone who's like me. I don't, I don't want that. I want someone who will challenge me and, ref and uh, who's fresh and and has different opinions and different ideas and different thoughts and, and who wants to see the other side of the coin. He has uh, an empty ear, right? He, he had, had an empty ear. He had a near-death experience when he was a child. It was the out-of-body kind. He drowned in a, um, I think it was a, a motel swimming pool. And it was a woman nearby who saw it, pulled him out. And when she pu pulled him out, she disappeared. So nobody can ever prove she was ever there, but Terry got out fine. And ever after, you know, displayed the after effects of a near-death experience, much to the dismay of his mother and brother. Uh, Terry is an identical twin. They are mirror twins, not just identical twins. So he was sort of primed and ready for me. <laughs> but he, <laughs> somebody of his opposite. <laughs> but we have so much 
fun together. I, I just I just can't imagine any any you know being with anybody else. And like I said, every year it just gets better and better and better. Ah, he's smoochy good. <laughs> That's beautiful. So okay, so speaking of psychic experiences, a lot of NBAs develop psychic abilities. Look, if Some you're that, psychic before you become psychic after. If you were psychic before, you become very psychic after. L let's establish that right now. Okay. So what if? So somebody's question is: they developed or they 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 had psychic abilities after their NDE, but they feel that they've lost them now. Well. The more they accept their differences, the more at peace they become with who they are. The psychic and intuitive ability, uh, abilities will be back. They may change in form and function, but they'll be back. Because they're part of you. You can't lose them. It's not possible but they can alter as you alter. So the more you relax into who you are now, the more you will find synchronicity to be part of your everyday life, the more you will find intuition, the inner ability to be part of your life, psychic ability the outer ability part of your life again it it i believe it it depends on how relaxed and open you are willing you are to accept the changes that have have uh, happened after your near death experience, and the more willing you are to work with them and accept them as a, a normal part of your life. Yes, that's actually what I say. It's like archery. The the harder you try, the more you're not going to hit the bullseye. But when you relax into it. And just let it go. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Uh, somebody would like to know if after effects of SDE, spiritually transformative experiences, are similar than NDEs. Well, it, it, all, it, it all depends on how big it was, <laughs> how, how, how in-depth that experience was. Certainly, if a person had the more extreme kinds of spiritual experiences, you know, a spiritual ex experience can totally change you, completely, totally, just like an NDE, then yes, indeed, they, they can be the same in the sense of um, they are threshold experiences. You know, uh, we're talking about Joseph Campbell and all all the work he did uh, with mythic experiences. When we're, when we're talking about how deep and how life changing these experiences are, if you get deeper and deeper and deeper into it, then you begin to recognize, as I did that these are all threshold experiences. Threshold experience in the sense that they take you to that moment of flip or change where you literally function in a different manner. I talk about that at depth in the book Edges. And I... Um, I really map out and lay out what that is, point by point by point by point. Absolutely. You want to talk about astrology and uh, numerology and, and rune casting? What, what, what do you think about all those? 
I used to do all of, all of that all the time. Um, I was a professional astrologer uh, long before I died. I was a professional numerologist. I taught uh, a lot, a lot of people, probably thousands of people. I wasn't into rune casting at all then. But astrology and numerology very much were part of my life. I was a technician in the sense of how I handled the, put, uh, putting together a chart. Um, the same way with numerology. Um, there are many types of numerology. I developed one of my own that I felt worked better than any of them. After I died, the way I look at, num at astrology today is very different. I'm no longer the technician I used to be. No, gone. Have someone else make my charts for me. I look at it in a very easy, different kind of way. Where the truth of that chart and what that person wants to know about it simply flows. Uh, same with numerology. Since I died, after I died, runes came to me. And it was on a full moon meditation meeting before I left Idaho. A woman who practiced rune casting, not the Germanic kinds of runes, but the family runes. Very, very different kind of rune from, from what most people talk about. And then that simply came to me. Um, it was at a full moon meditation meeting um, that a friend of mine held in his house. And I, I went there. I was about to leave Idaho, but this is one of the biggies that I went to before I left. And it was a, re a Renaissance team that had moved up into Idaho, had met my friend at a grocery store in Boise, and he invited them to uh, a full moon meditation at his home. So they came as invited guests, and they were so thrilled with the affair. It was a big one. Lots of people came, lots of food, lots of merriment. That, that they decided, this one woman in the group decided to give uh, three casting, to handle three questions from anyone in the crowd. So the first question, I was, I was standing way, way far away, um, yeah, near uh, on a wall. And I was watching and I remember in my head thinking as I was watching, no, that's not what that means. Oh, you, you should have done this or it would have been good if you'd have done that. I was just thinking these thoughts in my head. On the second question, the woman stopped, looked at me, pointed out loud and said, you know more about these runes than I do. And without thinking, I said, yes, I do. <laughs> I've never seen it before in my life. <laughs> so when, when it was all over, <laughs> I went up to her afterward and said, you know, what do you mean? I know more about these runes than you do. I've never seen it before. And she just looked at me with that Cheshire cat grin. And she said, well, I know you know, and that's all she said. So I asked her if she would prepare a set for me and she did and, and how much it would cost. She said $15. So she prepared my set, of course, that was way back when. 
and I, I picked it up at a at a, a full moon med, an, another meditation meeting. And as we all sat in, you know, in a group, a lot of us there, I took the energy, the beams as they went around, and 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 flushed them through the bag because I'd yet to open the bag. As, as they went around and kept flushing the bag because I wanted that bag to be pure and open, not filled with her energy or anybody else's. I wanted it to be open and in service to God's greater will. So after I left Idaho, uh, um, on the banks of not on the banks, near the Grand Canyon. I emptied that bag in my life, in my lap, looked at all those little pebbles <laughs> with runic glyphs on them and thought to myself, okay, guys, let's begin. And that's when I began. And I have found these wonderful little runic, runic glyphs to be wonderful in my research. I always took them with me wherever I went. Well, not always, but most of the time. They doing rune castings for others paid for my research. Yes, it did. That's where the money came from, a lot of it. It also enabled people wherever I went to get deeper into their own questions and their own thoughts and their own theories. It was simply a way to go deeper. So uh, the book, The Runes, Runes of the Goddess is now looking for a publisher. <laughs> and I hope someone comes forward and, and takes this wonderful set and uh, brings it back into publication so that other people can learn about them and, uh, and make their own set and use them and find that um, these incredible glyphs and, they, and, and it's family runes, they work as a unit. You don't ever pick one out of a pocket. They work as a unit. Um, can, can find as I did that all kinds of real magic exist within them and they enable you to share that with others. Beautiful. And the potential publer, publisher of that book is here today, actually. I won't yeah, say I, any names, but I hope they, take the book. <laughs> they are they are here. So Hello. <laughs> yes, it will happen. Um, okay, so so we've had a few questions for end of years, and I'm gonna try to sum them together. So a, a new person who has had an NDE, they're still struggling with what happened, what they experienced. And also a lot of us have been like you know, on all kinds of propofol and drugs. So we, we forget some things, right? Our memory, how can you regain? So, so what's, the best, what's the best piece of advice you would give to a newer end of year who is struggling, who is trying to get some, make sense of everything and get their memory back? If you could give, what would you suggest? Wow. Well, certainly knowing about the after effects, the pattern of after effects makes a big difference because then you realize you're not crazy. And, and that, that's big number one, know that you're not crazy. Um, big number two is to relearn how to think and how to speak. Oh, the difference that makes is just incredible. And number three, to really look at uh, um, each of these things that are different to you now and compare them with what was before. 
So do the before and after thing. You might write it down on a piece of paper. You know, just really look at before, the before column, the after column. And grant yourself the permission to be more of yourself, to be different than you were before, to be more of yourself. Don't be in a hurry to do that. And if you possibly can be around others who have gone through a similar route, like the, the IAN's near, near death groups, they're wonderful. They're absolutely like wonderful. our sharing group that we have. Oh, yes. They're absolutely every third what? Tuesday. Yeah. Um, no matter where you are in the world, check with IANDS. Um, that's I A N D S dot org, you know, www. Well, the easiest way is services, then the little at sign, I A N D S dot org. The people at the services, the office staff, can then recommend those groups or people in your area that will be helpful to you. So that's where you begin, and you um, and you, you begin with um, books that are very helpful. Um, the one book that will help you the most in the beginning. It it truly is a big book, and it's called the Big Book of Near Death Experiences. It really is a big book. Don't be frightened by that. Just flip a page and you'll see cartoons and drawings and all kinds of short stories. It'll take you from beginning to end all about you, about the near-death experience, after effects, where to go, what to do. It's a wonderful book. The big book of near-death experiences. It is the only encyclopedia in the world dedicated to near-death experiences and again it's full of cartoons and pictures and drawings it's not your normal kind of encyclopedia uh i wrote it <laughs> i know it's not um and i gave the copyright of that book to ians so uh, all the money that is spent to buy that book goes to ions does not go to me i don't see a penny all goes to ions because i truly believe that 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 book can be the one book for doctors nurses research experiencers family anybody and everybody that can help that them real realize what a near-death experience is how to handle it for them, how to be around you, for you, how to be around them, uh, to start over. That's your starting over book. Yes, and it's an amazing book. I have it. Okay, so let's lead again to, you have an event that's gonna be March 10th that people can go to your website. But what we would like to know that you can talk about is what you think is going what we're what is going on right now in the world and what is going on for the next couple of years march 10 you can attend if you want it is a zoom um it, it will be zoomed um it's a, it's a full body real um talk held at the um Walter Russell, uh, Walter Russell Museum in Waynesboro, Virginia, but it will be Zoomed. That is to say anybody in the world can attend. The only cost is donation to the Walter Russell Museum. You can give a dollar, you can give $10, $100, whatever you want to do. Walter Russell's near-death experiences 
and, I, and I'm saying that plural because he had one every seven years until his great illumination in his early 40s, I think it was. Um, his is the most dramatic and lengthy and overwhelmingly um, complex and incredible of any of the near-death experiences I've ever heard about, read, or, re or have been re referred to in history. So his is number one, Walter Russell. So if you can possibly come, come. I'm going to be talking about, you know, what we have been preparing for is here. And, and just be very, very, very brief. If you take the United States chart, and by the way, you can do an astrology, astrological chart about almost anything, anything that was born. Well, a country can be born and ours was. Uh, we are, our country is having, it's having a near-death experience, really. <laughs> our country is undergoing a, a Pluto return. People don't have that because the orb is too great. Um, so, so a return in astrology is, is where any, any given planet goes back to the place where it was when you were born. So Pluto is now in the same position it was when the United States was created as a country. You know, our, our, our 4th of July. Uh, and Pluto, if you want, want to just look at it in a, in a more general way, There's no such thing as middle with Pluto. The energy is really high or it's really low. Everything is seen under a Pluto um, return. Everything comes to the surface. Nothing can be hidden. Pluto means death of the old, birth of the new. So our country now is being challenged on our most sacred reality. Do we want to continue being a demo democratic republic or do we want to be something else? And we are being challenged heavily on that one just in our own country. Um, even though it is in 2022 that the critical year is of that return, it fully affects a four-year cycle. In other words, it began in 2020 in our country it will not end until 2024. Isn't it interesting that that's the run of a, of a president? Um, so here we now are at the midpoint. And that is the time when um, the power and intensity of Pluto will be the most felt. And literally, it means death of the old, birth of the new. There are critical days during this year that that, that power of Pluto will be the most intense. The first one was the very day Russia attacked Ukraine. There are several more this year. Then I talk about several other things that are coming. 
that will add to the tumultuous times we're now living in and will continue to live in. They will change, of course, a, a little bit. Um, and then I talk about and tend to uh, and show how to handle all of this. Because these are huge, massive changes. How do we handle that? How do we get through this? Well, we do it by being who we know we are. And I, I will give little exercises that will instantly bring you back to center, that will instantly enable you in full force to be and to continue as a powerful being you are. So everyone is invited, come. Thank you. And I'll, I'll make sure to post the link for everybody in the Hawaiian Islands Facebook group and uh, on the Islands Maui and Islands Oahu page. So we'll make sure that everybody knows where the link is. And a friend of uh, mine, Richard Hennessy. Richard, if you wanna unmute, you can go ahead and ask PMH your question. What do you like to be called? PM, P, PMH? Is that? PMH is my name. Oh, okay, fine. All right. They're, not, in, they're not initials. Okay, That's great. Not. Okay, thank you, PMH. It's wonderful to see you again. I saw you back about 1990 in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, <laughs> and you did a wonderful workshop. And my wonderful memory of the workshop is you taught us how to fluff our auras. If you recall doing that, yes, yes, yes. You, you said that's what you did the first thing in the morning. You got up and you fluffed your aura. So you taught us that. So that's a wonderful memory I have of uh, experiencing that day with you. Uh, the other thing I'd, I'd like to mention is uh, how I got there was because I had gone to a uh, wonderful four day retreat with Stephen Levine on mindfulness meditation. And at the end of the retreat, he asked people, 1988 it was, he asked people if they ever had an NDE. And I had no idea what it was, but people got up and spoke and it was remarkable. I mean, I was astounded. So I immediately, when I finally got back home, I went to the bookstore and I, I found your book, Coming Back to Life. <laughs> My first one. <laughs> yeah. And you had the end of the book, you have this closing statement. If you recall, back in the late 1800s, an American writer by the name of William Ellery Channing best described the philosophy of the average near death survivor. Okay, could I continue and read yeah, that? Continue. Okay, great. Thank you, PMH. Uh, to live with small means, to seek elegance rather than luxury, and refinement rather than fashion to be worthy, not respectable, and wealthy, not rich, to study hard, think quietly, talk gently, act frankly, to listen to stars and birds, to babes and sages with an open heart, to bear all cheerfully, do all bravely, await occasions, hurry never, in a word, to let the spiritual unbidden and unconscious grow up through the common. This is my symphony. Yeah, it truly is. <laughs> oh, well, I thought that was the most wonderful ending uh, to, uh, for a book. And uh, Thank I, you for bringing it back. <laughs> say that again? Thank you for bringing it back. Oh, my God. And those words, hurry never. I'm going to keep telling myself that every day. And finally, one more thing. Uh, in uh, Kenneth Frank's book, Lessons from the Light, yeah. Somewhere in the book, and I couldn't find it prior to our meeting today, he mentions that about the benefits of the near-death experience and really focusing on love and joy. And he said that those who don't have NDEs can have the same benefits by just studying NDEs. That's true. That's and that's true. what my question was. What do you think? Yeah, he, he calls it the... Um, 
what did he call it? It's like the, the, the magnificent disease or the magnificent bug that we can, that he hopes we all get infected with. <laughs> so we can do this too. <laughs> but yeah, Ken, Ken is, a, is a colleague of mine and a, a wonderful friend. Yeah, that's a wonderful book, Lessons from the Light. And he talks yes, about yes. you in the book. So oh, thank good. you so much today. Yeah. Well, hello. Yes. Yes, yes. Thank you, Richard. Well, is there anything else you would like to add, PMH? This has been such Have an amazing evening. <laughs> huh? Have we done our what? Is there anything else I would like to add? Pray for me on finishing the book, Edges. Number 19. Yep, yep, yep. And finding a good publisher and getting it out as quickly as I, I can. I think you will all enjoy it, laugh, and, um, and sort of groan. <laughs> with me <laughs> on all the things I went through, not uh, not only um, doing the research, but learning how to be a human being afterward, all the things that happened. Phenomenal. And maybe you and Terry can come promote it when you uh, get it done, come to Hawaii and I don't know that Terry would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd have to ask him yourself. Uh, if you want to, if you ever want to see a picture of my husband, you get on my website and you uh, uh, about me. You know, you, you press that on the on the home page, and it will you know dr drop all kinds of. Places you can go, things you can see, and there's a picture of him in there. Uh, and make sure to so for everybody to uh, make sure to go to her website and sign up for her newsletter, which is amazing. It's got all kinds of it's free, it's free, <laughs> yeah, and it's a wealth of information that she is. Uh, it's amazing how much information you always have in there, and well, uh, curious that's what we yes. all are. We're curious. And you can buy uh, Forever Angels from your website. And then, of course, on Amazon, all your other books, right? Well, it's, che it's cheaper through Amazon. Is it? It's a little more expensive uh, from me because I, I don't give you a discount. Amazon and, will. Yeah, but you licking the stamp is more valuable. <laughs> <laughs> I give to everyone the breath of joy that's really where near-death experience leads you is to joy and to finally accepting and loving the incredible work of art that you are and blessing the life you have and accepting all of the nightmares and fears in equal aplomb to all the joys and love. It's part of the same package. And that package is wonderful. Thank you so much. We are just so honored. You have a wonderful night and everybody have a wonderful night. Thank you for being with us. We'll make sure to post PMH's information in the Hawaiian Islands chat, uh, Facebook group. And get that stuff out about Stalin. Yes. Please let everybody know. Stalin is back. His name is Putin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, aloha everybody. Have a great <laughs> night. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>